that is uh, organized by our Neuroscience of Language project in NYU Abu Dhabi, funded by the uh, NYU Abu Dhabi Research Institute. Um, and um, in this lecture series, um, we've been inviting people uh, from the uh, you know sort of general community of language scientists who we find have somehow inspired the, the research that we uh, do in our own project. Um, my name is Lina Birken and I'm one of the co-PIs on, uh, on the project. And tonight I'm very pleased to introduce Jeff Bender um, from the Medical College of Wisconsin. Um, and we try to uh, sort of keep this lecture series very interdisciplinary and so like unlike us, the PhDs, um, uh, Jeff is, a, is an MD, um, uh, but interestingly, he has kind of, uh, we find our work to intersect with his, his interest uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a useful enough a way that we wanted to uh, have a chance to invite him uh, to speak here. Um, Jeff has had a remarkable career, and he has, has a remarkable career. He sent me his uh, CV, which was 46 pages long, so I'm not going <laughs> to read it. Uh, so I'll just tell you what his current jobs are. So he's a, uh, he's a professor of neurology, uh, professor of cellul cellular biology, neurobiology, and anatomy. He's a professor of biophysics. Um, he's the director of the stroke and neurobehavior programs um, at the Department of Neurology. Uh, he's the director of the language imaging laboratory uh, and, the, and an interim director of the Functional Imaging Research Center. Um, and so that seems like a lot of jobs. Maybe. <laughs> Is that too many jobs? <laughs> um, so, so Jeff is one of the sort of uncontroversially leading figures of the cognitive neuroscience of language and functional imaging of language, uh, more specifically. Um, and so he's done a lot of uh, uh, really important basic research on language. Um, um, but in addition to that, since he's a neurologist, he also sees patients on a, on a weekly basis. And uh, among his many honors, uh, he's actually a top doctor in the, in the Milwaukee Magazine two years in a row. So, you know, do you see those glossy inserts with the top doctors? So Charlie, he's, he's one of them. I was, that's to, for me the coolest part of his uh, CV. Um, so, it's just so different from us. Um, so, so, as for his career in the cognitive neuroscience of language, um, he was a sort of a crucial contributor and a key player in the early application of functional neuroimaging to language. At, at you know, really early 90s, this field does not have a very long history at this point, where people were sort of trying to figure out, like, can we get anything out of this technique? Like, does sort of language seeming regions uh, uh, activate uh, with uh, fMRI? Um, and so he's uh, sort of been part of this field from the very beginning, but has also had a tremendous longevity in that, from that you know, very early, very basic research, he's been able to, I think, build a research program that has a, a, lot, of, a lot of depth, and um, in a way that even for us who enter the brain science of uh, language from linguistics, there's uh, uh, useful points of contact, and, and it's sort of inspiring. Um, and also, most people working on uh, the cognitive neuroscience of language, we sort of try to either do the sound side of things or the meaning side of things, because it's really hard to do both. But uh, Jeff actually remarkably does do both. So he does uh, sort of cutting edge work both on the conceptual side of things, which is uh, we'll hear about today, but then also in, in phonetic processing. Um, and uh, personally, uh, I've, you know, in, in the course of my career, there's been a couple of times when I've sort of felt like, oh, now, I, now I've had a, a really an insight about uh, uh, something about uh, the brain organization of language. And I think in both cases, then I've quickly found out that Jeff already published that insight, such as, such as for example, the fact that there, um, the activity that is elicited when we are simply at rest, so not asked to think about anything in particular sort of fundamentally has to be the semantic network of the brain, which I think is totally right, and, and you said it first. Um, and so tonight I'm very much looking forward to uh, hearing what he has to tell us uh, tonight. Um, so his title is Concept Representation in the Brain. Uh, welcome. Thanks, Dina. That was great. 
great introduction, but you mind repeating that for my team sometimes? <laughs> uh, um, thanks so much for having me. Thanks, Alec, also for inviting me. Um, it's a great place, and I'm honored to honored to be here. And happy to be back in New York. Lena didn't mention that I did my neurology training up at Columbia PNS. So it's nice to be back. Um, yes, I'm a doctor. I don't recommend neurology training if you want to become a neuroscientist. It's really not the best route. It's been kind of a slog, but uh, we're here. Um, let's see what else for announcements. I was glad to hear that David Popolo's not here this week. He's out <laughs> Some of you know David, so the overall level and aggressiveness of the heckling less than <laughs> otherwise would be the case. So um, yeah, this will be uh, somewhat hurried, somewhat glossed, um, uh, because it's a, it's a difficult problem, as Dr. Murphy can tell you. Um, we are just scratching the surface, but I will show you what, what sort of scratching we're doing at this point. I'm going to focus on brain, so this is not a linguistic talk by any means. Um, we make use of uh, what we can learn from other disciplines, but our main focus is on how the brain works, and so that will be evident, I think, in the, in the presentation. And um, I also will be simplifying matters somewhat, making things a little bit tractable by focusing on lexical concepts rather than uh, combinatorial semantics or semantic composition issues. Yeah, sorry. Do not have a strong projecting voice. All right, well, um, how are conce concepts thought of in terms of their content. So this is a, a very old philosophical problem that was addressed by Aristotle and lots of people since then, Eleanor Roche and other people. And in those theories, we think of concepts as being uh, composed of features. And these features are things like you know parts that they have, actions they perform, qualities and properties that they have, what categories they're members of, and and formal predicate relations. So there's the northern cardinal, and you can say a lot of things about that beautiful bird and what its features are. But these are all, these are verbal concepts. Um, and so in a way, it's a bit of a circle here because we're defining verbal concepts in terms of other verbal concepts. And there are definite limitations to that classic approach, which I'm not the first to uh, make note of. These are well-known problems. One is that across all concepts, and that's a big set, um, the number of potential features is very large, and that's purposefully meant as a sort of humorous understatement. There's, there's more than you can count. Uh, and verbal labels uh, like this don't necessarily capture all the perceptual content. So what's the difference between a duck and a goose? Well, it has to do with something nonverbal about the shape of, of those two categories. Uh, there's no explicit relationship with neural systems in a system like this, so there's no, we don't think, dedicated systems for representing feathers or beaks or features like that. So there's no, consequently, no neural theory of how features and feature weightings are learned. Um, and that is okay. These kinds of uh, theories or models of semantic content have their uses. They just aren't very useful for understanding the brain. Another motivation for the brain-based approach is this phenomenon called category-related impairments. Some of you are probably familiar with this phenomenon, which uh, was first described maybe in the 1940s by a guy named Nielsen, but really came into prominent notice in the 80s with the publication of lots of papers showing that some patients with brain lesions lose their knowledge more for living things and other people with brain lesions lose their knowledge about non-living artifacts more than living things. So this is a, this is a strange phenomenon and aroused a lot of uh, theoretical and empirical work. And the lesions are different in those two cases, as you can see here in this, uh, my, my gloss of the review that Gennady did uh, 15 years ago. So what, you know, as a brain, oriented person, I look at things, data like this, and I say, why, why is that the case? Why, why are those uh, patterns happening? All right, well, let's start with a discussion of how we learn concepts. Um, and most people would agree on something like, like this kind of model. We experience 
exemplars of a category, and that doesn't necessarily have to be a concrete thing like an apple. It could be a very abstract thing like a, a, an apology or something like that. But we come across many exam exemplars and we extract common features about those exemplars. Uh, and then we assemble those uh, features into some kind of uh, abstract representation of the concept. And in this case, we're looking at what might be called a modality-specific shape concept for an apple. But shape isn't the only thing we experience by any means. In these exemplars, you can see that you're experiencing color, which is a completely different modality of experience than shape. You might say, no, those are both visual experiences. But in fact, they're organized in completely different systems in the brain. And you can have color deficits without shape processing deficits and vice versa. So one way to think about this you know, is uh, that the brain is a multimodal uh, abstraction device. And I've listed some modalities of experience around the perimeter of this circle. And the concentric cir uh, uh, rings within the circle are meant to represent higher and higher levels of convergence across modalities. So in addition to modality-specific representations that we build up from experience, we also build up combinatorial or conjunctive representations that combine uh, experience across modalities. And at the highest level of representation, maybe there are even uh, representations that don't contain any residual experiential content. They're amodal symbols or abstract uh, representations of that sort. Yeah, so with an, with, in the case of an apple, an apple has a prominent taste, it has a prominent color, it has a prominent shape, and yet there are things you do with apples, you eat them, and so there are certain actions associated with them and they have a characteristic size and so on. And maybe apples make you happy, so there may even be an emotional content to these. And the point is that every concept has a somewhat different proportion or mix of these kinds of experiences. So tigers have a completely different mix as do hammers, for example. <laughs> and then when we retrieve these representations, it usually occurs in the setting of a verbal label or a symbol. And what we think happens then is that the symbol elicits in a top-down <coughs> manner a recreation or partial simulation of some of these sensory experiences that we had that lead to development of the concept. So this is called uh, the embodiment theory of uh, concept representation. It means that the brain actually uses some of the same modality specific systems that it used to learn a concept in order to retrieve the concept. So literally when you hear the word hammer there's some activity in sound and shape and motion and proprioceptive and action systems in the brain that help you to understand what that word means. And the pattern would be different then for a different concept. So what, is, what might this look like in the brain? Well, it's, that's, this is a nice thing about this theory. It may not make any sense to you from an abstract, conceptual point of view, but it sure has a lot to do with the brain. And the reason it does is because we know where these systems are in the brain. We know where the color uh, processor is in the brain and the visual form processing system and so on, the sound system. And the theory is that next to these low-level uh, processing systems are somewhat higher level abstraction systems that are still modal. They still prefer and to process a certain kind of information and they store information that is referable to a certain modality of experience, but they're uh, more abstract. And so you can imagine an fMRI experiment or an MEG experiment <clears throat> where you have people process different kinds of concepts, and maybe they're weighted in terms of a particular kind of experience. So these are three examples of items that carry with them lots of knowledge about uh, actions performed by the hand. And, and that sort of concept might engage preferentially or 
differentially engage uh, systems in the brain that are linked with that kind of information. Likewise, for concepts that have prominent uh, color characteristics associated with them and sound characteristics. So when you think about the concept of thunder, for example, this is a good example I like to use. There's no tactile experience with thunder, really, unless you feel the vibrations. There's no visual experience. Uh, there's nothing you touch. There's nothing that moves. It's just sound. So under this hypothesis, the knowledge that you have about thunder is mainly stored in abstract association areas that get mainly auditory input and visual motion examples. So there's actually quite a lot of data out there now. This is from a review we did a few years ago uh, looking at 38 studies that approach this problem in this way. Now, what I want to emphasize and remind you about is that all of these dots in the brain, which represent activation sites in these 38 experiments, were elicited by, the activation was elicited by words not by sounds, not by emotions, olfactory experiences. They were elicited by words. So in the one olfactory experiment, which I think is right there, um, these right there, these were words that were like uh, garbage or words that have cinnamon, strong uh, olfactory uh, associations with them. So there's a differential distribution of these dots around the brain. The, the sound-related ones shown in he here in yellow are near the auditory system, which is in the superior temporal lobe there. Uh, this olfactory uh, focus is right near the uh, olfactory cortex in the brain, and so on. These are uh, dot the, the, the most studied of all of these are words that have to do with actions, so verbs, and, but also uh, tools that are commonly manipulated, and those. Uh, cluster around the sensory motor areas of the brain. So there's actually quite a lot of evidence for this general view, although it's still uh, not universally accepted. Well, um, one problem that I will spend the next 10 minutes talking about uh, in confirming this sort of hypothesis, or testing it, I should say, is how do you actually build a representation of any given word like tiger or apple. You can draw a picture of it like I just did on those slides, but how do you verify that your vector that's representing these values is, is accurate? Uh, there are methods. Uh, the most <coughs> common one and the, most, uh, the one with the longest history is a, is a method called feature production. So you give a, pay, a person about five minutes or so to generate as many predicates about a given concept as they can. So you might say tiger and they would say roars, has stripes, et cetera, et cetera. The problem with that approach is that it requires the subject to improvise, all right? So that you're not giving them any very definite cues. They're coming up with the things that occur in their head. That might be good. At least it gets the most automatically uh, occurring associations. Um, a bigger problem for us is that some of these uh, features that people generate are hard to assign to brain systems. So if somebody says it's made of metal, where does that go? And is that a visual feature? Is that a tactile feature? What is that? Um, yeah. Another method <clears throat> is to use large corpora of printed text and measure the degree to which the, word, the target word you're interested in co-occurs with some of these modality-specific verbs like see, hear, touch, smell, etc. And this method is uh, gaining popularity. Uh, the problem with it is pretty much the same as with the feature, similar to the feature uh, production problem, is that uh, the associations that tend to get expressed in text are the ones that are most um, necessary for distinguishing or describing a concept. And many features that are part of a concept and very automatically retrieved uh, by people aren't necessarily the most commonly mentioned in the text because they're given. So if we say, for example, in the text that a cat has four legs, it's unusual or unnecessary to say that the cat walks but it certainly does, or that it breathes, or that it has a neck, for example. 
these are features that just don't get tend to get mentioned because they're they're given. All right, and then the method that we are using in our lab, and which I'll spend uh, most of the time today on, uses this uh, technique, which is to ask people uh, to cue them to give uh, numerical ratings uh, across a set of dimensions. So. Uh, if we want to know, for example, how important is color to the concept of an apple, we ask people how important is color to the concept of an apple. So it's a very direct, uh, uh, relatively unambiguous method, and I'll show you some results. In the first study here, we uh, targeted 900 nouns. These represented both concrete and abstract concepts. So we wanted to see how our methods would generalize across a wide range of different kinds of concepts. This is one feature of the work that I'll present today is that we are trying to get a more panoramic view of, of at least noun concepts than has been uh, typical in the literature up till now. So we asked people to rate the words on these four, uh, five attributes. And the reason we picked these five is that at the time we started doing these experiments, these systems in the brain were the ones that we thought were well understood and would differentiate between different concepts, at least concrete concepts. So there could have been a longer list. We left out smell, taste, all sorts of other dimensions. But uh, one interesting question is how much of the semantic content, content is captured by just these five uh, experiential dimensions. So you get the method, basically. They gave us a number between zero and six for every word that they rated. And these are some example vectors uh, for different co concepts. There's six examples here, tomato, growl, apology, gravity, avalanche, scissors. And you can see that these ratings make pretty good sense. So color is very salient to the concept of tomato as a shape and manipulation experience. Some. Uh, some words have very high sound ratings, but very low visual ratings. Why are we doing all this? Well, it's because we want to uh, test that hypothesis I mentioned before. So we did this fMRI experiment with the same 900 nouns. So these 44 individuals each went in the scanner and they read these 900 nouns one at a time in a random order took about an hour and a half to do that, and they made a, a judgment about each one. Is, is this experienced with the senses? We call this a concreteness decision. So can you experience this thing with the senses? Um, and we did what's called an event-related design. That's not too important. It just means that we're going to look at each, the, the brain response to each word individually and not, not cluster them together into a, into a general condition. And the important thing is that we then looked at the brain activity across time, across stimuli, across subjects, as a function of the ratings that we got in the other sample. So if a, content, a, a concept like Apple got a high color rating, we would expect that concept to produce more activation in the color center of the brain than a concept like thunder, which has no color rating. Okay, so what I'm going to show you now is the results of this experiment and how, how these maps compare with uh, actually experience, experiencing the perceptual information itself rather than a word. So just, just as a reminder, this little focus back here in the left uh, occipital, ventral occipital lobe is showing a, a consistently, significantly, reliably stronger response to words with higher color ratings than words with lower color ratings, all right? The words don't have any colors. They, they're just associated with colors. And what's remarkable is that this area is very close to the area of the brain that is actually um, activated when you see something that is colored. So a, a, in this case, a um, uh, abstract uh, set of uh, shapes that either have color or have no color, uh, shown in a grayscale. This act, this uh, response is bilateral. Notice there, that's 
interesting. The brain is mostly symmetrical. I mean, most systems in the brain are represented in both hemispheres, but the <coughs> linguistic or semantic, I should, shouldn't say linguistic, semantic representation of color is uh, strongly lateralized to the left side. And it's apparent from this kind of result that the hypothesis is basically correct. There's little things we need to investigate still, but the hypothesis is that the same neurons that process color during experience store color-related meanings. And they may not be exactly the same neurons, but they're very close to each other. Okay, the situation gets more complicated with shape knowledge, and again, these are areas of the brain that responded more to words or concepts that people thought uh, relied on shape knowledge than uh, concepts that didn't rely on shape knowledge. And these include in lots of different areas. This is the lateral occipital lobe, LO. The inferior parietal sulcus has regions that respond this way. And then there's a lot of, well, there's some ventral temporal regions. Ventral means undersurface of the, of the temporal lobe here in both hemispheres. And then there's surprisingly some regions around the area of the brain that controls motor and uh, tactile uh, processing. Does this match what we see with shape perception? It really does, strikingly so, I think. So these are experiments, separate experiments done in other labs than, than mine, uh, examining areas of the brain that respond more when a coherent visual shape is presented uh, of an object. These are all usually objects. Uh, compared to a, a presentation of a visual stimulus that doesn't have a recognizable shape. So uh, lateral occipital cortex has a big complex that does this shape processing, and then there are two other uh, complexes here on the ventral surface. What about this area? Well, it turns out that, that those regions are very involved in uh, recognizing shape in the tactile modality. So these experiments were done uh, without visual input, just having people try to recognize shapes by feeling objects. So, we think this is a multimodal, so this is not a simple unimodal visual process. Shape analysis and storage of uh, information, knowledge about shapes of objects is occurring in both high-level visual systems and in high-level sensory motor areas. All right, this is, uh, these are the uh, pattern of activation that occurs uh, that's associated with knowledge about manipulation, and I won't go over these details uh, exhaustively, but they this network matches very well uh, brain activation patterns that have been uh, demonstrated by observing actual hand actions or hand movements. And they include the supermarginal gyrus here, the anterior part of the supermarginal gyrus, which we were talking about earlier. Uh, uh, in the seminar and an area that's just anterior and dorsal to the lateral occipital complex. It seems to be uh, specifically involved in um, storage of knowledge about actions. Uh, maybe that's because it's a meeting point of visual processing having to do with shape and somatosensory processing and motor processing. We've called this lateral temporal occipital, but other people have given it different labels. And then we look at sound knowledge and visual motion knowledge. I'm sort of ignoring these frontal areas that I don't understand because I don't understand them. But this uh, anterior temporal region uh, associated with sound knowledge is just next to uh, the primary auditory inputs into the superior temporal region. So we have a composite map of all these results shown here, which gives us an idea of how this complex system, and this is already getting complex and almost impossible to understand just with five attributes. So imagine what the real uh, activation maps look like. But this is a composite map showing in yellow and orange some of these areas that are involved in storage of manipulation and shape knowledge, uh, and in the complementary colors, blue and green, some of the regions that <coughs> store sound and motion knowledge. And the reason we've given them complementary uh, coatings like this is that we, they, they overlap uh, differentially. So this seems to be one system here and here, 
and a different system sandwiched in between that does different things. Now we've interpreted these patterns as suggestive of a, of a complex processing stream hierarchically arranged that combines auditory and motion-related visual information, so specifically motion-related uh, vision, not things like shape or color, uh, and, a, and a different processing stream that seems to combine uh, motor-related uh, knowledge about actions, but also shape and somatosensory act, uh, knowledge about shape. And one way to interpret this distinction, this division of the system, is in terms of whether the knowledge has to do with events or experiencing events, which uh, tend to uh, be associated with uh, sounds and visual movements uh, versus other kinds of knowledge that has to do with static objects and how we, how we man manipulate them. So that's the main conclusion so far. Um, this distinction between events and non-events uh, or objects is interesting. And I know that some people uh, in the audience are interested in this basic ontological distinction too. Um, we did a follow-up analysis of the same data that I just showed you, but <clears throat> selected uh, 40 event nouns and 40 object nouns. Some examples are given here. These are all nouns. They're carefully matched on all sorts of word form variables. So they're, they're matched on length and uh, frequency and frequency of uh, component phonemes and graphemes um, and imageability too, by the way. Um, and looked at these this subset of 80 words out of the larger data set to see if there were any consistent differences between matched event and non-event nouns. It turns out that as we, as our intuitions tell us, um, events have higher motion ratings on average and sound ratings, and non-events have higher uh, manipulability and color ratings. So this is kind of interesting. We didn't uh, necessarily know this from previous published literature, but this is a uh, uh, a, if you will, a, a componential analysis of the distinction between events and non-events. Now, events and non-events have all sorts of other properties on which they differ. Many of them are linguistic and um, combine with uh, verbs in different ways. Uh, but these are, let's say, basic um, uh, neurological factors on which these, uh, the meanings of these two categories differ. And so it turns out that when we do a direct comparison between events and non-events, we get stronger activation in these two regions for event nouns than non-event nouns. This kind of result involving very similar brain regions has recently been demonstrated by a few other groups. And so we think it's a, a reasonably reliable uh, result. And uh, interestingly, these activations overlap with these blue-green areas that we interpreted before as being preferentially involved in storing knowledge about events because they preferentially store knowledge about sounds and visual motion characteristics. And so this is a processing stream hypothesis about why this occurs. We know that the sound uh, input originates here, and so it seems to combine with experiences of, uh, regarding visual motion in this region and in this region. And then we have inputs from uh, a, a system in the brain that processes knowledge about spatial relationships. And this is probably coming in from the uh, dorsal parietal lobe here, although we didn't, in this experiment, have any way to uh, measure that phenomenon. So another, a couple of other questions that occur um, uh, looking at this experiment. Five sensory motor modalities. How much of all of our semantic knowledge can really be explained by five sensory modalities? Um, and, and how do those five sensory motor modalities 
relate to abstract concepts. So what about concepts like truth and honesty and justice and things like that? How, what, what's the color rating of justice, you know? So um, one way to look at that problem is to look at the, look at the data and see, see how well the activation patterns for these five modalities, when combined, can predict the activation pattern to a word, any, any given new word. So that will give us an idea of how much of the total sort of variance in activation across concepts can be explained just on the basis of these five dimensions. All right, so that's one question. And then we can also look separately at con pr predicting the activation for concrete nouns and, and abstract nouns. All right, so this, is, this is, gets kind of wonky here, but this is what we did. So, um, so to make a predicted activation pattern, we start with the ratings that the, the word has on these five dimensions. And we know, I just showed you what the attribute maps look f like for those five uh, attributes averaged across all the words. So these are like basis functions, if you like. And, and these, are, these are calculated without using dog as one of the inputs. So this is a, calculated from a separate set of words. Then we just combine these maps as linearly weighted sums uh, weighted by these ratings. Is that pretty, pretty straightforward? And that gives us a predicted activation map for any concept. Then we can go back to the data and look at the actual brain activation for that concept and, and evaluate the similarity between those activation maps. Okay, so that's what we do. And more specifically, we started with these continuous regressors, created the attribute maps that I showed you before, and then created 80 predicted word maps from using words that were left out of this of the full sample. Did that for each of the 80 words and so on. And then we went back to the data as I said before and constructed actual activation maps for each of those 80 binary regressors. So each one is associated with an observed activation map. And then we just correlate the two across the full set of 80. So it's an 80 by 80 matrix. And we scored each word um, in the following way. We correlated the predicted activation map with each of the 80 observed act activation map and just rank ordered those in terms of their correlation score. So the correlation score was then just normalized or scaled to a zero to one uh, value. Now, if you think about this, the random chance score averaged across lots of items would be 0.5. So anything better than 0.5 is a significant improvement or a significant ability to predict the activation map. And that, and that turned out to, to work across all the words combined together. And there were, I should mention, there were 40 concrete words in the test set and 40 abstract words matched on all kinds of things. But it, and it worked well for the concrete words, but didn't work at all for the abstract words. So just what you would expect, I think, because these um, dimensions are not coding things that are important for abstract concepts. Also, uh, I have to say that the overall level of accuracy of prediction was far from perfect. And what this tells us is that there's more to life than five sensory motor attributes, <laughs> in case you didn't realize. And this is another interesting result. So we did the same analysis using one attribute, combinations of two attributes, three, four, and five, et cetera. And this is a, these are averaged uh, prediction accuracies across different numbers of attributes. And it, and it just goes up, at least for these five attributes, as you increase the amount of information, uh, it, it improves. All right, so some limitations of this work I've discussed so far is the big one here that's been raised by many, many people in discussing embodied cognition theories, how do these theories explain abstract concepts? And there's more to experience than five broad dimensions, and uh, I've listed some of those here. So how do we deal with this? 
I'm going to talk for about 10 more minutes. Well, um, I wanted to say a few things about abstract concepts and try to demystify abstract concepts uh, a little bit. Um, they still are mysterious, but um, there's a lot of uh, good evidence that we uh, learn uh, abstract concepts from experience. How else could we learn them? Uh, some people argue that we learn about abstract concepts mainly from verbal inputs. Uh, but I think there's a lot of nonverbal information uh, that helps us learn about abstract concepts. Some, some of you probably are familiar with this, this kind of thing where the, the shapes uh, interact with each other and one leads the other and recruits the other one and they're going to ditch this, this guy in a minute. <laughs> and he's really mad, so he breaks in there. He's, he's angry at that triangle, so they ditch him again. <laughs> but he persists. He gets out of there. So um, I think you can make the argument that a lot of seemingly abstract concepts uh, can be learned. Because we have a theory of mind uh, system in our brain, and we can interpret behaviors in terms of what we would think if we were in that situation, we can learn concepts like these just from watching very simple uh, events in the environment. So abstract concepts are learned from experience. But these experiences are often complex situations, including multiple agents, as you saw in the last movie, physical events and mental events. So we have space, time, quantity, causality phenomena that help with concepts like these, for example. We also have affective experiences. So these are experiences that uh, relate to emotions that we experience. Uh, we have social experiences that contribute to our knowledge about abstract concepts. And we have purely cognitive experiences. So every time we have an idea <clears throat> in our head and we tell someone about it, and our mothers said, well, that's a good idea. You've learned the concept of idea. All right, so it turns out that abstract concepts can be rated on these kinds of dimensions, and here's some data showing that yes indeed when you compare abstract to concrete concepts they have higher ratings on things like association with thought processes, emotions, quantity, time, social experiences, etc. Alright, so very quickly we have very recently devised a concept representation system that incorporates 65 dimensions. <coughs> So that's all of experience, the 65 dimensions. I told these guys earlier. They laughed at me. But uh, that's, that's as many as we can think of. Um, and so they're, they're shown here, and I obviously don't have time to go through all of these, but the criteria was that these are plausible neurological, neurophysiological systems in the brain that have a somewhat distinctive uh, uh, anatomical layout, location if you like, or they've been distinguished from other kinds of systems and presumably represent distinct kinds of information. All right, so what did we do next? We used Amazon Mechanical Turk. Everybody familiar with that? It's a crowdsourcing tool. And we showed them things like this. We gave them a word, in this case chair, we gave them a sense cue to tell them what we meant by chair. We didn't mean to chair a department, we meant to sit in a chair. And we asked them a question about the word, and in this case it's a question about the dimension of pain. And we gave them some calibration examples for words that would receive high and medium ratings. And then they gave us a rating on a <coughs> Likert scale, okay? Uh, we got lots of data, spent a lot of money doing this, got 16,000 ratings on 535 words on 65 dimensions. So, and the words uh, were somewhat uh, carefully selected. Some of them were forced on us by the uh, Intelligence Advanced Research Project Administration that funded this study, but um, some of them we, we added in afterwards. And they include lots of different sets. Um, we did some quality metrics to exclude bad raters. And there were quite a few bad raters, but uh, they were there to make their $4 an hour, I guess. 
Uh, so this is an example of what these, the rich data set that we've gotten from this, from this work. This is just the 30 animals that were in the 535 word set and we've averaged their vectors across all 30 words. And so we're starting to see uh, very systematic, very reliable, strong differences between these a priori categories like animal that, by the way, have been important in neuropsychological work because there are patients who develop deficits that just involve animals. So we're trying to understand why that happens. It could be that these systems that are preferentially involved in coding animal knowledge are the ones that are damaged preferentially in those patients. All right, so uh, these are vectors like that for different a priori categories like human beings. Turn out they have biomotion body, human characteristics, face and speech characteristics, um, plants, which don't, vehicles, tools, musical instruments, et cetera. So it's an it's extremely rich data set. We don't have time to go through all these these details, but some, but, but some of these words that we obtain ratings for are rather, rather abstract uh, concepts. And a few verbs as well. We can now look at these vectors and make quantitative uh, comparisons between them. So these are, this is a difficult slide to manage, but these are um, vectors for abstract entities and non-living things, artifacts, and in red, the living things. And just as we intuited, um, concrete categories, these big concrete categories like living and non-living objects, have higher ratings on most of these dimensions that have to do with sensory and motor experience, but abstract concepts actually have higher ratings on other dimensions. I think I better skip through some of this work. Yeah, so you can take the vector of any given word and compare it to any other, <coughs> other given word and calculate the Euclidean distance between them, the similarity between them. So this is just showing an example of some of that. So the target word here is actor, and these are the 10 words out of the 534 other words that had the closest uh, vector to actor. You can do that for all the words. And then you can also do things like uh, clustering analysis. So this is a result of a k-means clustering analysis of the vectors for all 535 words. They fall into categories that closely match our a priori uh, category assignments. So these are not, th these, the 30 items in this set were all animals. And all of the animals, all the items in the 535 word that said that we thought were animals ended up in this category. So, uh, so, the, so the ratings capture these uh, category distinctions very well. Uh, some of them are kind of interesting, like we saw a differential categorization of festive social events and verbal social events. Um, yeah, interesting. And in the previous slide, um, loud vehicles and quiet vehicles, non-social places versus social places. So social interactions seem to be a very important uh, feature of these of abstract categories. And you could also do hierarchical clustering, which um, is a unsupervised um, parameter-free clustering of the data. Uh, which can sometimes reveal finer grain details um, in, the, in the structure of the data. So in the case of the animals, for example, the, uh, the ratings actually distinguished a cluster of water animals, another one of small land animals, large animals. There's two transportation animals, horse and camel, and that turned out that they had uh, high ratings on this uh, spatial dimension we call path because they move through space and they had higher ratings than the other animals on lower limb movements. And so that was enough to push them into a separate category of transportation animals. Uh, musical instruments were divided into blown, struck, and bimanually played instruments. And that has to do with the fact that we have different, three different dimensions for different areas of the body that interact with objects. 
All right, so brain activation elicited by retrieval of a concept is partly predicted by the sensory motor content. Uh, suggests that concepts are partly stored in modal systems. Modal systems in the brain also include higher order sensory, spatial, temporal, social, affective, and cognitive systems. That's the hypothesis. And many concrete and abstract categories can be distinguished on the basis of these kinds of modal representations. So our goals in the future are to provide a principled neurobiological account of concept acquisition, abstract concept representation, semantic similarity, and category-related impairments. Now, what about symbolic representations? We mentioned those earlier. They were at the, in the middle of those concentric circles. What about that kind of representation in the brain? Is, this, is all concept information in the brain distributed and, and uh, simulated de novo whenever we <clears throat> experience a concept? So, yeah, generally, uh, amodal representations are assumed in most traditional theories, like artificial intelligence and cognitive science theories, linguistics. Um, some people actually believe that they're necessary for conscious awareness of concepts, and what I mean by that is that some people will tell you that a person w does not experience a concept unless the node for that concept is activated in the brain. It doesn't matter if all the distributed relevant information is activated. You have to have a node that represents that concept, or the, or the person will not experience the concept. Uh, well, maybe these symbolic representations are useful for linking concepts with phonology. After all, phonology is a, a modal symbol, so we're, maybe this is a useful way to link the two. Um, by the way, another word for these is lemma, uh, for people who may be more familiar with the term. Uh, although, uh, when I say amodal symbolic representation, it doesn't necessarily mean a verbal or even a linguistic representation. It could be a nonverbal concept. So, um, yeah, I'm going to have to skip over some of this stuff. Um, well, the idea is that, um, as, I, as I mentioned before, there are these modal systems, primary modal, association modal areas, and there probably are cross-modal association regions that combine information from sound and vision, and et cetera, but why not very high level uh, representational systems, hubs or uh, heteromodal association regions, we call them. So we have evidence that those do exist. We have very strong evidence, actually. Um, we did this meta-analysis that appeared a few years ago where we took 120 studies that examined this question. So, what I mean by that is that these 120 studies uh, were not looking at things like sound or color. They were just looking at meaningful versus not meaningful. All right, so the gist of this uh, analysis is that yes, those, those high level hubs uh, in the brain respond to meaningful stimuli more than less meaningful stimuli and it doesn't matter what the sensory motor content of the concepts is. Better skip through all this. And here's the cartoon with the regions labeled. Uh, so these are high level, highly convergent, non modal, we call them heteromodal. Some people use the word polymodal or cross modal, uh, convergence zones areas in the brain where the, they're, they're as far away from primary sensory and motor systems as you can get. And that's the point. They're, combining information across many modalities. And what matters with these, uh, with, with uh, the neural activity in these areas is just whether the stimulus is meaningful or not meaningful. So here are four different comparisons uh, that manipulate that factor. So this is what our model looks like with modality-specific perceptual systems, modality-specific content, uh, concept knowledge and amodal cro or cross-modal convergences. This is a different model than uh, what we call strong embodiment, which is the argument that all of conceptual knowledge is stored within modality-specific systems in the brain. The chief proponent of this view is this guy, although I think he's changed his views quite a lot. But the idea is that you know, if you have an arm-related word and you want to understand it, you basically uh, hear the word and process the phonemes, 
and then you activate the motor cortex, and that's all there is to it. So these models look different, you know, in the, in the embodied, in the strong embodied view, you've got this, what I consider to be a rather large area of cortex that isn't even considered in the model. <clears throat> and our model also is different from this popular uh, model that was published a few years ago called the ATL Hub Model, where the, it, I agree with the outline of the model and its basic tenets, uh, but they got the anatomy wrong. They put the heteromodal hub here in the anterior temporal lobe, and it's really a little bit more posterior, and it also involves the inferior parietal lobe region. So I think I will have to stop. Thanks. Yes. Size. Yeah, You're asking size. about size. Oh, okay. We did distinguish shape and size, so we have a separate dimension for size. And uh, size is really interesting because mm, some of you might know this about the ventral visual stream that uh, things that are large are, tend to be processed more medially toward the midline of, the, of that stream, and things that are small tend to be processed more laterally. And it doesn't matter what the actual stimulus size is on the screen. It only matters what the real world size of the object is. Very interesting. So, so if that's true of pictures, why isn't it? Why wouldn't it be true of words? You know, why wouldn't the word whale activate more me slightly more medial structures, and the word fly, gnat, something like that, activate more lateral structures? So, so we definitely have that dimension in our. That's one of the sixty-five. Did that answer your question, or? I don't think so. Mostly, yeah, but I also was wondering about how you actually define shape. So we don't, in this, uh, in the first study, we didn't distinguish between visual shape and uh, tactile shape. In our new study, we specifically ask about what is, how important is the visual, it's something like that. How important is the visual shape, how important is visual shape to, the, to your understanding of this word? Something like that. Yeah. I guess I wonder how much confidence you have in those 56 vectors. 65. 65. 65. <laughs> uh, on which, <laughs> uh, on which you yeah, that's the answer. Right so that's just one, that's one set of basis vectors, which you can imagine other sets yep. that are just near rotations. Um, yes, yeah, we've done factor analysis of, the, of those data. And they, we, so, we, so you say you think those, those dimensions kind of on biological possibilities? That is right. That's correct. I suspect you can pick dimensions that would be biologically impossible. You'd still get distinctions between. Yep. Yep. Yeah. 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 Good point. Democracy. Yep. Do those ratings. Yep. Absolutely. Yep. Useful for escaping from a hotel room or something like that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, <coughs> Yeah, so that goes back to the second slide I showed, which had, had the thing about interest in the brain on it. Um, that's why we picked those. But you're absolutely right. And I'm sure we missed some. I'm, I mean, I'm sure there are, especially in the more complex, higher order uh, dimensions, I'm sure that there probably are better ways to ask about that kind of information than, than what we used. So we started with a bigger set. I think the set will probably shrink a little bit as we, for example, we had, uh, well, this is the strongest example. We had one about uh, how happy does it make you feel, the concept. And the other one was how pleasant is it? And those turned out to be correlated at 0.99 something. So the mutual information was the highest for that pairing than, than for any other. So we'll, we probably will just get rid of one of those. It's unnecessary. We did factor analysis and got 16 factors using a randomiz randomization test and looking at eigenvalues that exceeded the 
chance level, but those 16 factors only explained 81% of the variance. So the question is, do you want a compact representation or do you want one that's very complete? I, and I always bring up the example of dime, which was one of the words in the set. And we have ratings for face processing because, related to face processing, because there's a specialized system in the brain that does face analysis. And we have one for body part analysis. And so dime was the only word on the whole list that had a high face rating but a low body part rating for reasons you can imagine. And so do you want to, you want to, otherwise they were pretty highly correlated, but do you want to collapse those and then lose the ability to distinguish dime from policemen or something like that? Um, maybe that wouldn't happen. Maybe there's enough information. But. So it's a exploratory uh, project at this point, for sure. You know, somebody else had, um, yes? No. Uh, well, none of this latter stuff I showed has been. Some of, a, a couple of the um, action-related word studies were done in French, I want to say, but not to this level of detail by any means. No, they're all native English speakers. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but I don't want to claim that every native, native English speaker has the same semantic representations. Uh, it's just that at this point in the program, we're interested in commonalities across people rather than differences. Um, so kind of bringing together the amyloid work and the motor work, I'm very interested in, uh, I think like one of the hard things when I'm ever on reading over this research, reminds me of like, at least all the various emotions stuff, is that it's, I don't know like what's, what's necessary for concept representation. Yeah. See, I'm seeing these giant activation maps. Now. Yep. Is that the concept, or is that just things that correlate and get coactive yep. when people are thinking of concepts? So uh huh. Kind of bringing all these things together. Ep Epiphenomena. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so what do you what do you think about uh, the necessity of modal representation <coughs> and concept representation? So I think even the word necessity can be taken apart, unpacked a little bit. Ne ne necessary for what? Um, so I think that there's, I think there's strong evidence that lesions or brain damage that affects modal regions can impair processing of uh, concepts that depend on those modalities. So we see, for example, in Parkinson patients who have mainly motor deficits that they have um, uh, differential impairment of their knowledge about verbs compared to nouns. Um, and that's been seen in amyotrophic lateral sclerosis also, which is a pure motor neuron problem. Um, and there are other examples. There's a case of a patient who developed a high-level hearing loss from a focal lesion in the left posterior temporal lobe, and he had preferential impairment or differential impairments on uh, words like tuba, you know, that depend on sound knowledge. Um, so. I think it's it's a very general question, and you know you can you can answer it in different ways. At the same time, people with hemiparesis from stroke, um, you know, who are have bad damage to their motor system, don't necessarily have they don't lose their ability to process action verbs. They're just maybe a little slower. So. My feeling is that the a lot of the basic conceptual processing doesn't depend on the highly modal representations, but in some contexts it probably does. If you're doing fine discriminations between very similar <coughs> concepts, then it probably does. In fact, there was a study I mentioned before uh, from Sharon Thompson Schill's lab, and they had people looking at words and discriminate, matching them, grouping them on, in terms of their color, uh, the color of the designated referred to object. And uh, the activation in this color region that I mentioned before was stronger when you had to do a discrimination within a color category, so light brown versus dark brown, you know, and match the objects at that grain level versus between color categories. And so that tells me that, you know, it's very context dependent, it's very task dependent. So you, you would need activation of that color center to do the hard version of that task, but not the easy version, presumably. More of a comment. 
we started off with uh, something very similar to conceptual uh, empiricism, no empiricism, parsed through the ideas that we rely on our senses. And actually, when you get to abstract concepts, you uh, you pretty much uh, got to the solution that was offered a long time ago, basically an nativist solution to some extent, or mm. at least it seems like it, mm. right? So I wonder if you feel that these regions represent or are essential for acquiring abstract concepts. Do you consider yourself now a nativist? Uh, no. I, I'm, a, I'm with Larry on most of everything he's claimed, and I actually almost quoted him on the one slide about wh how we learn abstract concepts. I mean, I'm a nativist in the sense that we're born with these brain systems, and they do certain things, and they constrain how we interpret or process experiences. Um, but I would say that uh, in order to learn abstract concepts, you must uh, have complex experiences. Those experiences have to involve low-level, you know, vision, for example, audition. Um, uh, but uh, the essential features of what makes an abstract concept, gives it its meaning, is higher-level combinatorial representations. Uh, so, for example, we you know we we talk about theory of mind all the time, but what is theory of mind? What's what what is animacy? What's intentionality? Well, those are abstract concepts that arise from uh, processing biological motions, for example. So, something that moves and displays a higher order kind of movement, like animals show, is more likely to be an agent and and more likely to be intentional than something like a piece of cheese or something like that. Um, and, uh, you know, some uh, uh, experiences having to do with um, social interactions, too. So our, our theory of mind, uh, which again is, I think, a, yeah, made, uh, it's an inborn uh, capability that we have to translate, it has to do with something like mirror neurons, has the ability to translate what we see in other people, their facial expressions, but also how they behave, and translate it, mirror it into our own perception of what is in our minds. So that's an inborn capability. But I don't, you know, I don't think that we're born with genes that code abstract concepts specifically. I don't know. It's, I'm not a nativist or a non-nativist. I'm both and in between. There's a remarkable degree of similarity in location of these things across subjects that we're depending on. Yes, yes, that's and, true. Yeah, we uh, talked about that earlier. When, and, but we also know that the brain is being very plastic given um, disruption of the formal input, and, which suggests that the similarity across people have to do with how the brain is structured based on normal sensory input. Yes. Yep. So that suggests that the kinds of um, agreement on concept representations you're going to get across subjects when you look at the brain are going to be precisely ones that are downstream from yep. sensory, because yep. that, that's the only way to get the brain over. I think you're right. So there might be other things that would not show overlap across subjects that are important to concepts, but yep. you, because they're not based on uh, ultimately on sensory input yep. wouldn't show up necessarily as and much. It's like looking at an EP farther out in the timeline. Things get out of sync and people get out of sync the farther downstream you go and the more random things get. Yeah. So in some sense this methodology, particularly at the group level, is going to be predisposed to find things yeah. that are related to Yeah, that's true. Um, it depends on the experiment. This, These last experiments I showed where we uh, meta-analyze those 120 studies. So those were uh, not only across groups, but across a big group of studies. And there was a consistent activation of the, these hub areas, these conceptual hub areas. And that, But that's not to say that within those areas, the pattern of activation for one concept would be the same across different people. For sure not. I mean, how could that happen? There's too much randomness in the system for that to happen. So if you're looking, if you're trying to do a multi-voxel pattern analysis and combine you know, this voxel and this person with that voxel and that person, 
yeah, it won't work. You, so you need uh, you know hyper alignment, multi dimensional alignment techniques to pull that off or do something completely different like representational similarity analysis. Yeah, that could do that. Oh, yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, so we've so we've taken um, the last map I showed with the uh, high-level heteromodal network and subtracted that from the areas that are um, modulated by these attributes, and that that works. I mean, you get a definite distinction between the two. And actually, when you do this. It, you can do the same prediction analysis, but confine it to a particular regions of the brain, right? You don't have to use all the brain boxes. And when you look at, <clears throat> this is a, another paper that uh, Leo has come, Leo Fernandino, Fernandino is a postdoc in my lab that did most of this great work. There he is, there. Um, he's got a paper coming out showing that when you confine the analysis to areas of the brain that are uh, overlapping between the, so what did he do? He looked at areas that are overlapping between the uh, high level conceptual hub networks and the areas modulated by those attributes. Those areas work great, but if you look at lower level areas like V1, visual cortex, I think he created the map by using uh, just a simple paradigm involving visual stimulation or something, but no linguistic task. Um, when you look at those areas, those, those voxels are useless for predicting the activation patterns. Um, but they're great at predicting things like length of the word. Yeah, which is interesting. Those techniques are super sensitive to stimulus characteristics like that. There will be a reception downstairs. Thanks. Thank you so much.